Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another exciting broadcast of Deep Cough in the Deep. I'm your host, Jeremy Lopez, and today I want to talk to you about the power of grace. You know, the other day I was doing a life coaching session with a dear woman from Canada, and one of the things we were talking about was the power of grace and how much grace has transformed her life. And I wanted to share that a little bit with you each today because I believe that grace is sufficient for each and every one of us. And, you know, even this year, knowing that I lost my dad back in March 1st, and, and his birthday happens to be today. Day, which is January 21st, and of course mine follows the next day, the 22nd. But knowing today is a day that could be sorrowful, it could be, uh, you know, hard, and it is hard. But yet we know that God said His grace is sufficient. And many of you out there I've talked to said, you know, I couldn't imagine losing a parent. I can't imagine, you know, going through, through a divorce. I couldn't imagine losing a child. You know, I couldn't imagine, you know, being in deep depression or suicidal or whatever it is that maybe so many people on earth suffer with. But you you know the great thing about God is we might not truly understand exactly how we do make it through things, do we not? I mean, many people have said, or I've told people before, you know, I don't know how I would survive if a parent died. I mean, I don't know what I would do if or when my father passed away or my mother. And yet, guess what? Here we are in January, and it's been about nine or ten months since my father passed away. And yet, you know what I've realized? It's His grace that is sufficient. It overrides everything, anything in everything in life that we seem to look at and think there's no human way possible I could deal with this right now or or go through this or lose my job or, or go into debt or lose everything that I own or have someone that I love die or have a fiance leave or whatever it is you're struggling with. But folks, let me tell you something. His grace is sufficient. And what does that grace mean to us today? Well, I wanted to share with you a couple of scriptures because grace is the message of each and every one of us. It's not only just given to us. It's freely given to us that we can give it away to others. And I think so many people right now in the body of Christ, we struggle with that essence of, you know, how much is too much and how much is not enough and how much is, you know, going overboard. But yet each and every one of us have been saved by grace, folks. And the Bible makes it plain that we've been saved by grace. If we have been saved first and foremost by grace, don't you think for a moment that other people deserve that same honor? and respect to be given that same amount, that unlimited, unthinkable measure of faith that we as human beings cannot seem to offer people. But guess what? We must try our best to offer the measure, the countless powerful measure of grace that have been given to us. Because what was given to us, folks, guess what? It's our job, our responsibility, and our duty to give that same grace to whosoever. And when the Bible says to whosoever, Whosoever, you know, that means that whosoever means anyone and everyone. It doesn't matter who they are, what they are, whether you agree or disagree, whether your theology or your doctrinal beliefs goes against them, or or maybe they just sort of blow your mind because they're totally anti everything you ever thought a person could be. But guess what, folks? God's grace is sufficient. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, which means God loved us enough to cast us not aside but to cast us further into the grace of the pool of, of that's unlimited of His grace. And that's where we need to be, is in the ocean of God's grace. And I want to read to you today a couple of scriptures. And that is Romans chapter 1, verse 1. And it says, Paul, and guess what, folks, by the way, Paul was considered one of the greatest apostles that we've ever known. And so let's read what Paul says. Romans chapter 1 verse 5, it says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. Now, before we read further, think of it this way, folks. Think of it that Paul here, who was formerly Saul, killed Christians. He hated them. I mean, he had them put to death. He was deceitful. He had he had Christians set up, you know, to where he could catch them. I mean, this guy was no good, folks. But yet, guess what? Through the moment in a twinkling of an eye, God's grace was sufficient. God's grace has always been there before even Paul became or Saul became Paul. God's grace was always upon his life because God's grace is upon all of us. And yet that same grace gave Saul a chance to start over again, another chance to live again or live really for the very first time as with his eyes wide open, enlightened with the power and illumination of God's glory. And yet Paul continues 
continues to say, you know, I'm set apart for the gospel of Christ. And verse 2 says, The gospel He promised beforehand through His prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And it goes on and on and on. And I want to read verse 5. Let's skip down to verse 5. It says, Through Him and for His namesake we received what? Grace. An apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. Guess what that means? It means verse 5, Paul's letting you know that in verse 1, look, I'm called to be an apostle. I'm called to be set aside, set apart for the gospel of God. First and foremost, what is the gospel? The gospel is the good news. So Paul went from a state of being Saul who was no good, a state of being evil, bad, set up people, deceitful, killed Christians, killed people, those who opposed the Jewish law, guess what? He had them put to death. And yet he's, he's now saying, I've been awakened. I've been enlightened. I've been illuminated by the grace and the power of God. I mean, so I am called now for the good news. I'm not called for to speak on hell. I'm not called to speak on this. I'm not called to speak on the dangers that's coming to Israel. Let's, let's put it another way. What do we see prophets today do in America. Many prophets say they're doom and gloom and say God's judgments against us and, and all these other wretched things. But God, folks, let me tell you something. God's wrath and God's judgment was poured out upon His Son on the cross. It wasn't the, mean, it wasn't the fact that God was a mean God. It wasn't the fact that God was, was crazy or, or, or that God could not wait with a vengeance to just kill people and He couldn't deal with it any longer so He decided to torture His Son. Folks, we're not talking about that. That gospel is a warped, demented gospel. We're not talking about that kind of gospel. What we're talking about is the wrath or judgment that God stored up because of what people have done to Him and, and almost turned their back upon Him and basically slapped Him in the face because here He, here he comes birthing forth a new creation, a, a, a universe, a, a planet Earth with hills and valleys and, and put skin upon these spirits and said, look, you know, like Adam in the Garden of Eden, I, I want you to enjoy eternal here and, and, and have the pleasures of this life and, and eat of whatever you want to eat that when you take a bite of the fruit that I'm giving you in the, and walk through the valleys, it's sweet, it's good, it tastes good and, and you can you know feel the wind upon your face. It was a place where God created us to be in His image and likeness but to enjoy this creation, to live a life that is successful, powerful and not having to work for anything but be able to just vast in the favor and the promotion and the presence of God, never lacking for anything, never wanting, never desiring, because everything we'd ever think about we ever wanted was always right there with us, always in us, always around us, surrounding us. And so God wanted to, uh, to, to create this utopia world for each one of us that we could enjoy Him and walking with Him in the cool of the day, having fun with our God and being Him on earth. And, and guess what? Man decided to go a different way. They decided that, you know, we don't want this stuff. We want to be able to eat from our own tree. We want to eat from, even the one you tell us not to eat from. We want to do what we want to do. You know, we want to choose to serve and do whatever we want to do. And, and we'll make mockeries of you, God, and tell you and, and do things that you don't want us to do. And so, what do you expect God to think, folks? God's grace has always been sufficient. His mercy always will endure forever. His love has never given up on any human being. But guess what? Even those who betray Him, He loves. Even those who hate Him, He has grace on. And guess what? Because of what humanity humanity has done against him, what did he do? He turned around and said, look, I'm still not going to hate you. I'm still not going to kill you. I'm not going to pour my wrath upon you, my vengeance, my judgment. Here's what I'm going to do. All of that that I would, that would normally you would deserve because of what you've done towards me. And once again, here's the idea, folks. Not because God says, I can't take anymore. I'm sick of these idiots. I want to kill them all. I want to burn them all at the stake. I want to just tear them to pieces. And so I'm so angry. I'm to give it on my son and just just make my feelings just pour out through him. Folks, if that's the kind of God you serve, your you're, you're demented, disgusting ways, pardon my expression of God, are horrible and hideous because that's not what God's after. God never has ever hated us. God has never you know, wanted to deliberately disown us. As human beings, what God wanted was for us to give him the same treatment that he was giving us, which was love and, and, and just honor honoring him and walking with him and being joyful with him but god said you know what this is these are the things that that you know um you deserve i mean i, I these are the things you deserve but because i'm not going to do that because i'm not going to 
pour my wrath upon you, destroy you, and kill you, and, and pour judgment. Even with Noah, he said, look, I'm never going to do that again. I mean, I couldn't imagine God's heart saying, I can't even deal with this. I couldn't imagine a world that I'm going to have to wash away and, and basically cleanse and start over again when you couldn't even find a handful of people who were who wanted to honor Him and just love Him. And the thing is, oh, God doesn't ask for much. All He asks is for us to love Him and to, and to show Him grace and show the same affection that He showed us, that same love and affection and power and grace and mercy towards Him and to, the, and to those all around us, to the whosoever's on earth, and to be Him on earth. And that's all He ever wanted. But when, you know, when humanity begins to betray a God who, who shows nothing but pure love and essence of grace and mercy, you know, what do you expect? You know, and so, so God said, look, I'm, I, it breaks my heart to have to do this, but I have no choice but to do this, Noah. And so God gathers Noah up and his family because there wasn't anyone else that really honored God or loved him or even wanted to talk to him. And so God gracefully put save Noah, the few people. And think of it this way, folks. God could have easily said, you know, that's true. You know what? Nobody's nobody's good. And so here's Noah and his family who I've seen righteous in my eyes. But you know what? I've just, I'm not going to save five or ten or, you know, or seven people, you know, when the whole world is just evil. So let me just wipe them all out and start over again. And there'll be no record of this. There'll be no record, no account of, of me ever destroying anyone. Because if just think of it this way, folks. If God destroyed Noah and his family, we would never have a record of any of that ever happening unless God prophetically just happened to tell a prophet one day that guess what? There was a world that happened before you. And so what does God do? God saves the few. God saves the few. And you know, even with with Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, here it is with Abraham saying, you know, hey, how about 50? How about 100? How about 25? I mean, come on God, I'm trying to bargain with you here to let you know that if there's any good in that city, you know, will you save them? And unfortunately God was like, look, Abraham, I would really love to do that. But there's really nobody in that city good. I mean, there's just nobody. And it wasn't the fact that they were not loving God and trying. You know, God doesn't kill or destroy people who are loving and trying. God, you know, just misses the, the, the and was disconnected, so to say, you know, from people because people wanted to be disassociated with God. And there was nobody good. But yet, the good thing about even that story was there's Lot and his wife. And, and so he says, you know what? Fine. Then I tell you what, I'm going to save the two. I'm going to save the few. The literal minimal of few here that just has a good heart. And yet, guess what? Lot was proven to be good, and so God saved him. And God's always been into the saving business. And it's not the fact that God hates you. God is mad at you. You know, so many people say, God's going to destroy America because of gay people. God's going to destroy America because of these drug addicts. You know, I've even heard stupid, idiotic, stupid people, you know, part of my expression, you know, say, God's going to destroy America because we have, uh, you know, Obama's in office. I want somebody to say, folks, seriously, what kind of warped lifestyle have you been living and, and what kind of theology have you been thinking? God is such a grace God and even the greatest apostle ever here. Has God been displeased with Obama? You know what? Sure he has. But here's the question. Has God been displeased with President Bush and Reagan and, and all the other and Thomas and Jefferson? Has God ever been displeased with all those people? Yes. Here's another question. Let's, pull, let's look at the plank in your own eye, folks, because I know so many of you would you know just think he is just antichrist and you know Obama's just antichrist or you won't even respect him I call him President Obama and so you're going against even scripture itself about showing honor and respect to governmental authorities and so guess what let's look at the plank in your own eye and my own eye and guess what God's saying God says and guess what I have been displeased with you as well have you let God down, folks? Sure you have. Have I? Absolutely. Have you ever said things where God says, man, I, I, I'm just so embarrassed right now, you know? Or, or God says, you know, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't deserve that from you, or I didn't think you would do that. Sure he has. So guess what, folks? Has Obama let God down? Yes. Have you and I? Yes. Absolutely. And the responsibility of what you think you know in your deep revelatory things of God, you know, that if you disappoint God, amaze, imagine even the, 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 the bigger disappointment that you've let God down more than even Obama because of the grace or the, the revelation you know of God's grace and power and authority. And guess what? You've let him down worse for that reason, that main reason alone. And so I look at this and I say this, folks. The greatest apostle also ever made it plain, I am now set apart for good news. 
to tell the world about good news. And then in verse 5 he says what? That through him and for his name's sake we received grace and apostleship to call people from among the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. He's letting you know, folks, grace. Let's look at another one. Acts chapter 6, verse 8. I love this. Acts chapter 6, verse 8. Stephen. Stephen was another great man of God that God called and equipped. It says, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miracles, signs among the people. So isn't it interesting? Think of it this way, folks. Isn't it interesting that God wanted to make sure that the record book of one of the greatest books, that the greatest book that ever was written, you know, made it a note to say, let's, let's, how, let's define Stephen. And he says, now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power. Folks, let me tell you something. I would love to be honored by God to have God look at me and say, you know what, it's not about your dynamic prophecies you give, your your accuracy that you pour on, or, or your miracles that you do. It's Because He even made it plain. Look, you know, people do this kind of stuff, and you can depart from me. I don't, I don't know who you are. And do you know why God would have to do that? It's simply because of the fact that... that, that Consciously, we have to be aware that God's grace is why we are called. If we were saved by grace, what what else is there is there to give but God's grace, folks? God never. Let me tell you this. First of all, for any of you and all of you, and I'm going to break. Many of you have quit listening to the broadcast, and many of you have told your friends, "Man, you got to listen to this broadcast. It's good." So if you're the one that's barely holding on, you know, to the broad broadcast of Jeremy Lopez, or you're the ones that are diving in it because you're hungry and thirsting for this kind of stuff of what the Bible talks about, I want to tell you something, and this maybe will help you to put you over the edge one or the other, and that is this. That how many times did God, did Jesus, ever mention the word hell? Guess what, folks? Once or twice. And it still never referred to sinners don't burning and going to hell. Now, once again, we're not getting in some theog- theological discussion. Don't care about that. I'm talking about the idea of Jesus never, ever, 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 let me put it to you another way, ever recording anyone ever dying and going to hell. Jesus never, ever recorded anyone out there to everyone he came in contact with about how disgusting they were to God, how God's wrath was against them, or God's evilness was against them, or how my Father in Heaven cannot tolerate you, or my Father in Heaven can put up with you. How many times has Jesus ever said that? Folks, not even one. He didn't even come close to hinting around to that. The, the, you know, think of this way. A prostitute, I say this a lot, but it's true. A prostitute woman, and l- let's put it in modern day 2015 uh, terminology. A whore. A prostitute. A dirty slut. I'm, I'm Pardon my expression, folks, but I'm getting real with you because of the fact that I know many of you out there have have called people like Obama antichrist or evil or, or we've looked at people and we've said those homosexuals they're going to destroy the nation and, and, you, and you call them every wicked name in the book or whatever it is or whoever it is you're against or here's the idea. So we're talking modern day terminology. So to this woman, you would say she's a slut, she's a whore, she's a prostitute. You would say whatever you could if she was the one here today being presented to you, maybe in the form of Obama, maybe in the form of your neighbor, or the form of your family member, or someone that's your neighbor you can't tolerate. Guess what? You would call this modern day terminology this woman today. This is what you would do. And yet, guess what God did? This is what God did that came in flesh and blood. What did God do? God came down because He loved the world. Not loved the religious people. Not loved you because you're a Holy Ghost Spirit-filled Christian. That's that's not even in God's agenda. God loved the world. God loved everyone on planet Earth. And in that, in that moment, those who are cursing Him, hating Him, screaming at Him, blaspheming Him, God. Said, the Bible says God so loved the world. He says, you know what? I love every last one of you right now. Yes, even you who's cussing me out. Yes, you who's destroying destroying your, your your president. Yes, you who's destroying your body. Yes, you who's cheating on your husband. Yes, you who just murdered 15 people. Yes, you who gruesomely killed and murdered a child. You. God so loved the world. And that's hard for me to fathom, folks. 
Because I can't tolerate people who hurt children or animals or old people. I can't tolerate any of that kind of stuff. But guess what? He says, your ways, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts, Jeremy. You couldn't imagine. It's never even entered into your heart. Even the things I've prepared for you. And I'm thinking, me, God? Do you know what I've ever done in my life that was displeasing to you? And God says, you know what? doesn't matter. My grace is efficient. My grace is efficient upon your life. And so here we see a story of a woman that's a prostitute. And you know what Jesus did? He says, look, go and sin no more. I'm not the one that's going to accuse you. He respected a woman who did not deserve respect. He honored a woman by not saying, you filthy, rotten piece of crap. (laughs) Pardon my expression again, folks. But guess what? You know what? I might say it, but you're thinking it. And so many of you would sit here and say, you know what? Get our God. Get our God. Because you know what? Those of you who say, get, them, get, get that president God. Get that horrible you know, agenda that these people have over here. Get, you know, for those of you who think that, you're no different than the religious system. You're no different. And yet your holiness and your false righteousness can look at that and say, oh, but that poor woman, you know, oh, poor her. Well, let me ask you a question. What about poor presidential uh, you know, uh, candidates? What about you know, poor neighbor? What about the poor uh, you know, person who's struggling, you know, with this area, that area. What about those people? That's my question to you is, where's the the true righteous grace that we have upon the people today? See, it's so easy to show grace to somebody in the Bible who Jesus showed grace to. That's easy. What's hard is showing grace to people around you who who in your your eyes you've already judged to be evil, wrong, or, or horrible. Here's my question to you. Everybody on earth, folks, everybody on earth is struggling with the same exact thing. And guess what? So are you. You're included in the mix, folks, just like I am, that we're all trying to work our way into the kingdom of God. We're all trying to find a better life for us. We're all trying to find the life that God has for us. And we're trying to find it through through drugs or, or through Buddha or through Muhammad or through, you know, uh, some crystals or some, or for our, in, in our situation, we're trying to find it through through Christ. Guess what? Everybody on earth is, is trying to find. Everybody on earth is seeking. And yet it's easy for us to say those horrible, wretched Muslims, those, those good-for-nothing Hindus, those horrible, nasty, these people or that people, But I have news for you folks. This is where we've all missed it. Is they're all seekers too. And they're raised in a culture that never knew of who Jesus was. So how on earth can we not show grace to those who have never heard the message of a loving God, of, 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 of good news? How can we not show grace to those who do not know any better? How can we not show grace to those who have never been like me and you? Guess what, folks? You can say this all you want to, but you're fortunate. You are fortunate. You are, you are blessed to be able to hear the gospel in a country or a family who raised you in Christianity. How dare us begin to judge other people for the harshness uh, of what their life you know, uh, has put upon themselves much as other people simply because they were not raised in a culture of millions of people, thousands of people, or never raised in a family where they never even heard of really who this Jesus guy is. And yet we have the power to judge a person who's hurting or wounded or, or maybe someone we don't even understand. And yet I sit here and I think, what have we become? we become a society in the Christian faith of, of demented, horrible, wrathful, judgmental people when the whole time God says, that's not my church. That's not the people I wanted to come forth. That's not who I am. And so guess what Stephen was known for? A man of God's grace. Let me read another one to you before we quit today. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7. But to teach one of us grace has been given as Christ appointed us. Let me read again. But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Guess what, folks? I have news for you. You have been given. Every one of us, the Bible says, has been given grace. Who are we not to show that same amazing, powerful, unmeasurable, unlimited amount of grace that's been given to us. How are we not able to show that upon everybody? And many of us say, well, you know, we're called to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. I can barely deal with that. You know, some of you might say, 
Okay, Jeremy, I'll go with that one. I barely can deal with that. So I can sort of be a little bit more loving like Jesus was. And, and then you'll turn around and we'll say, but that grace thing, oh, no, uh-uh. No, God's going to get them. Man, God's going to get them. And guess what? I'm his, I'm his mighty, righteous, holy vessel. And so God's going to use me to get them. Or God's going to cause me to, to pray for that dirty, horrible person, but never, ever take them dinner. Never show them kindness. I mean, let them know. Put on my nose to them. Let them know that I'm not like you. I am totally not like you. I'm not a sinner anymore. Praise God, I'm a sinner saved by grace. And you know what? You can go through all of your spiel. You can go through all of that in your mind. But mentally, folks, when you do not go and visit your neighbor and say, hey, how are you? I'm, I'm your neighbor and I'm so sorry. I haven't been able to talk to you for a long time or I've never met you and we've lived next to each other for three years. And, and you might perceive maybe they're Buddhist. You might perceive, you know what? It's a lesbian couple next door. You might perceive, you know, that maybe they're just dirty people or maybe they just have a filthy mouth. And you might perceive whatever it is you want to believe that you your perception says is wrong or bad. And, and let's put it another way. Your perception. Your perception always is not is not always the truth, by the way, folks. And so all of a sudden what you perceive is so is so uh, horrid and, and wretched and despicable. And so what do you do? You should say, you know what? I'm not going to listen to my perception anymore. I don't care about that kind of stuff. What I care about is going to my neighbor and saying, I am really, truly sorry that I've never gotten to know you. And I'm really sorry that, you know, I've lived next to you for a couple of years. Hey, oh, let's do this. I would love to be able to give you maybe uh, dinner one night. I'd love to make dinner for you one night. Have you and your family come on over. Or I want to let you know right now, I'm always here for you. And if you ever need me, hey, you know what? Let me know. You can Welcome to borrow my lawnmower anytime. You know, I, I'm next door. I would love to be able to let you know you can depend on me as your neighbor. Neighbor. And guess what? You begin to be the Christ to someone else. When you go the extra mile, let them know that you mean it. And do mean it, folks. Because guess what? That grace has been given to you by Jesus. And if we follow the example of Jesus, we don't tell them how bad they are, how bad they're going to hell, or all this other you know, stuff we come up with. What we're called to do is be Jesus. And we don't have to tell them about, if you die tonight, you know what, you're going to hell. You know, let me ask you an honest question, folks. And let's just, let's just be honest about it. Did Jesus ever say that? Name me one time that Jesus Christ, God in flesh, ever told anyone. Now, I'm going to challenge every one of you right now. Because you know what? I'm not concerned if you, if you, you know, uh, leave or stay. Because my concern is to let you know how much I love you and how much that God loves you. But also, not just you, but everyone around us and how much Grace is powerful. So how many times did Jesus ever tell anybody they're going to go to hell if they don't accept Him? Not a one. Not a one. And many of you can pull up some scriptures, but guess what? You don't know the Greek. And so many of us do not understand these certain words of, of that we look at that do not mean hell, for one. And therefore, we have to look in that and realize that, you know what? It's not about a doctrinal theological discussion here on this broadcast. It's about being Jesus. It's about letting those know who, are, who you perceive as... Is bad and rotten and horrible and good, I mean, are no good, guess what? To say, you know what? Let's not tell them about, you know, where they're going to go if they don't or how horrible they are if they don't know Jesus. Let's let them know this. Hey, guess what? I love you and I'm here for you. And God's really got some grace upon your life like He does me. And God is just really good to me and God's good to you. And you begin to open up the door for them to get to know God. How are they going to get to know God? Not through some you telling them and, and building through your little, you know, doctrinal belief of God, you know, telling them about that. No, it's about seeing you and your example and how are you living. If you want people to see God, then show them how you're living. Because if you can't show God through uh, to people of, through how you're living, then you obviously don't really know Him. And so it's time for us to be able to be God to someone. Someone Let God's love. Love is a great weapon. Love is the greatest tool of, of healing we can ever know. Love makes us whole. Love heals us. It heals our wounds. Love covers a multitude of sin. How many people in the body of Christ truly, truly know that scripture? That it covers thing, things that are sinful. And what do we do? Man, I can't wait to expose the sin in your life. I can't wait to tell people about what I found out about you, Brother Jeremy, and you, Sister, you know, Karen or Linda or whatever, and people do that. And the whole time I want somebody to say, first and foremost, you know what? You are disobeying Scripture. You are being an anti-Christ. Anti means, uh, means uh, instead of, not against. 
Antichrist does not mean I'm against God. It means I'm formulating my own God instead of God Almighty. And so when you do that, guess what you're doing? You're, you're, you're formulating an Antichrist mentality because you're not willing and, and ready because you haven't died yourself enough to be able to cause love to cover a multitude of sin. Hello? Love covers sin. It doesn't expose it. It's not your job to do that. Your job is to love and to cover people with grace and mercy. And watch God. Then watch God come in and do what God needs to do. And it, and God will never ask you, what do you think I should do in this person's situation? You know, how many people go to church and, and they say, oh man, I can't believe it. Wow, they're living together and they're coming to our church. Oh my God, how can the preacher put up with that stuff? And you know what we realize? We forget that that the presence of the Holy Spirit's job is to convict, not yours. And the timing of uh, timing is God's, not yours. And so let's leave God, let's let God be God and the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit and not do His job, but do what God wants us to do and that is to love and to cover and to protect and to cause grace to begin to abound much. The Bible says where much sin is, does much grace abound. Folks, if you think in your, in your limited perception that there's powerful sin all around you, then you better rejoice and praise God. That's right, I did. I said when when a lot of sin's around you, you better rejoice and praise God. That's right, I said it. You know why? Because God said it. God said where there's a lot of sin, there's a lot of grace right there. Where much sin abounds, does much grace even abound even more. So you better rejoice because you're you're in the presence of, of, of more grace than you are sin. And so if you want to look at the glass half empty and say, I'm around sinful people. I can't go into that restaurant Restaurant, that claw, that club. I can't get near that neighbor. I can't get near, near that lesbian. I can't get near, get near that prostitute. She, you know, she tore up that family. That little prostitute. Yeah, whatever. You know what? When you when you feel you're around that, you better rejoice. You know why? Because you're in the presence of not the glass being half empty, but the glass being half full. Thinking positive and not negative, which is there's more grace there than there is sin. Praise God for that. And so you better abound in the grace of God that it, that you are standing and beholding at that moment. To give that away to all those that you perceive is is so much lower than you in their sinful nature. Folks, we've got to be able to be sons and daughters of God and know that how much God loves us and God is there for us and He's protecting us and He's giving us His grace and His mercy. That's the love of our God. Right then, right then and there. That's the love of grace. And let's read the last one. Well, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is by grace. Let's read the last one. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9. Hebrews 13, 9 says, Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace. Listen to me now. Don't be carried away by all these crazy doctrines. Instead, it's good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace. So we'll close with this. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9. Folks, don't get caught up in all the crazy doctrines of warping God, making God look mean, and then you're carrying out the judgment written against people because God cannot tolerate it anymore. No. You know what the apostle says? He says, you know, cast those stupid doctrines aside and those theologies and those teachings. Cast those aside and give people grace. Move in the grace that's been given to you. Go into grace. Celebrate grace. Because that's where God wants us to be found, is in the grace of our loving God. God can deal with the rest, folks. God's a big God. He can handle everybody. And plus, He knows what people need out there in the world. He knows when their timing is that they need certain things. And when their heart is ready to be pricked, to be healed and open. That's God's job, not ours. And so today, let's arise as a powerful... Uh, I don't, I'm not a big army fan, because army sort of does displays this you know, militant, mean aggressiveness. That's not what I'm after. I'm a prophet of God's love. I'm a New Testament prophet that believes and believes in the love and grace and mercy of our God because I'm a Jesus prophet, not an Old Testament God prophet. And so therefore, folks, be New Testament people. Be New Testament people who gives grace and love away. And so today, purchase, pur, 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 purpose today in your heart that you are one of these grace people to display, to give, to show, and make sure sure that it is so unlimited to everyone you come in contact with.
Hey, by the way, thank you again for tuning into our broadcast. It means a lot to us. It really does. And if you get a chance, go to the website, identitynetwork.net. You'll find a lot of great, healthy resources. And we try to purge our website, you know, weekly to where we're making sure we're giving good, health, healthsome, healthy, wholesome messages away that will display God's grace and love. That's, what, that's the message of this ministry of Identity Network. It's God's grace and God's love. But if you get a chance, I want you to do me a favor. Go to the website, identitynetwork.net. When you do, look up one of my newest books. You will totally love it. It's called According to Heaven, the Heavenly Pattern. According to the Heavenly Pattern, The Seer School of God's Imagination. I'll say it again. According to the Heavenly Pattern, The Seer School of God's Imagination. You guys would love it. It's a brand new book I just launched out. And I encourage you to, uh, to get this book to where you're able to get the book or the ebook to where you're able to see how God sees things, the imagination of God's way of, of quote unquote thinking, you know, through us and, and, and towards us and then towards other people. And then you're able to see from a seer's point of view what is it I'm called to see? How am I called to see people? How am I called to move into the heavenly pattern of what a seer and a prophet does and thinks and should display to the earth? You're going to love this newest book. If you want to order it by phone, you can call us at the office at 205-362-7133. That's 205-362-7133. God bless each and every one of you. And remember, God's grace truly is sufficient for each and every one of us today.